Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for being able to join us. Uh, just before I start, I would like to thank the organising committee very much for their help in putting the programme together. So I've been in touch in recent months with Malte, Johannes, Martin, Cosima and Daniel, and they've all been immensely helpful, and I thank them for that. Um, this morning, what I'm going to be looking at is Merleau Ponty with regard to child psychology and pedagogy and reappraising students embodied and intersubjective experiential realities in contemporary education. Um, this work draws upon the contribution of Merleau Ponty's series of Sorbonne lectures on child psychology and pedagogy in relation to students embodied and intersubjective experiential realities and pedagogical practices in education. These series of lectures by Merleau Ponty, there were eight of them, they were translated into English for the first time in 2010 by an American academic, Tanya Welsh, and she went on to write extensively about the lectures uh, in her book, The Child as a Natural Phenomenologist. And um, some of these original writings, lectures by Merleau Ponty inform what we're doing today. Um, the lectures took place between 1949 and 1952 when Merleau Ponty was Professor of Child Psychology and Pedagogy before he moved in 1952 to become Chair of Philosophy at the College de France. For Merleau Ponty's perspective, Students must be seen for their embedded and bodied existence and the world as a common field of existence if intersubjectivity is going to be possible. And our position um, with my colleague Stephen Stoll from the University of Adelaide, who unfortunately can't join us today, but is someone I've been working with for the last decade, is we see the potential of reviewing these lectures alongside the main text of Merleau-Ponty's work. Just in setting the context for today's lecture, our position is, broadly, that educational aims and ideals are necessarily contested. We consider this to be inevitably so, given the complexities surrounding the global health pandemic and the changing nature of the relationships between students' lived experiences their social realities and their wider life worlds. So we view education as contested and never a settled matter. We think, therefore, that teachers pedagogically need to engage with educational theorising about how students can more coherently reflect and report on their perception of reality and truth, especially in relation to their intersubjective and embodied experience. Our view is that humans experience things in the world as the same, or claims that they do so are problematic. We believe in differentiated futures, and we think of some of the assumptions that if students have a similar experience, they will have reached a similar outcome, are problematic. In terms of phenomenology, we think it has considerable potential in reaching beyond positivist and standardised approaches to learning and assessment. We think it, they can appreciate how embodied and subjective experiences connect with our wider social and cultural lives. We're using embodiment to mean the tangible form of becoming aware, i.e. of perceiving experiences, bodily in this case, to be meaningful worth pursuing. In Merleau Ponty's terms, we see the benefit of making the invisible visible over time. What begins as pre-conscious experiences becomes a much greater set of self and social embodied experience, matters which are important for personal growth and for health and well-being. We believe that these ideals could thrive at a sensory level alone but nowadays, where education frequently requires verification, language is needed. Now, this is complex 
as students need at times to write it out. And this requires, that key matter of transfer requires to be methodologically addressed. We also believe that in the potential of phenomenology to merge two ideas. The fact that you can be championing, championing the autonomous learner, but also the shared benefits of experiences in education. So of balancing the I and the we, the self and the social. We believe that framed this way, aspirations in education are better placed to recognize and appreciate many of the uncertainties that young people face. In terms of mapping out the lecture for you, I think it contains four main parts as we go through. Under the background section, we see something of how we became interested in the works of Merleau-Ponty. Um, when we're studying Merleau-Ponty, in addition to his Sorbonne lectures, we, reveal, we study further writings in relation to embodiment and subjectivity. Uh, and the variation which exists between human beings in relation to how they view and understand the world. We then look at the issue of methodology and of what methodologies might have the potential for some of these ideas on education to be part of curriculum planning. And then we look finally at pedagogy and the broad pedagogical principles which might provide students with opportunities to review and reflect upon the intersubjective experience. Very briefly, I'd like to say something about my background and how uh, I became interested in this. Before many of you were born in the 1980s, I was teaching physical education. Um, at the time, in Scotland, this was a minority subject. The curriculum was dictated by analyt analytical philosophy and the work of Peters and Hart, where students studied columns of academic subjects. Okay? There were some difficulties with this. There was the assumption that students would be interested in this type of curriculum, and there was assumptions that um, it would be beneficial for them. Um, in, fact, in point of fact, the students weren't always interested in this and not many of them were able to do particularly well at it and it tended to benefit the more able students. So in Scotland during the mid-1980s, there was a wide-scale curriculum review and the ambitions of it were that certification would pay a part for every child, no longer the few, but now for everyone. And the other factor was that they would broaden considerably the subject basis of the curriculum to reflect what students were interested in. So, in a matter of a few years, physical education moved from being a rather fringe minority subject to being a subject which students could study, and they could study it right through to university entrance level. So it became an examinable subject. Now this was both exciting but challenging. Now, what students were being asked to do in this high stakes examination was in order to be authentic to what physical education is, i.e. a movement-based subject, students were being asked to move and then later selectively reflect on what they had done and to do that in a quite sophisticated way. And what became apparent was, this was quite challenging for students to have movement experiences and then reflect on them. And when it came to trying to ascertain who would pass, it was quite difficult because students would score very highly for the movement-based parts and very poorly for the analytical ones. And somehow you had to try and work out who would pass. So, by 2000, when I was working in higher education, I began to investigate this, starting from the practice problems. So I was working from practice, eventually, back to educational theory. 
not from theory to practice, but the reverse route. And I looked at all the attributions that teachers could provide as to why students had difficulty with this. And they ranged from the fact that it was the writing it out that was tricky. And if they could speak it instead, that would have been okay. So I tested all of these things and found that not to be the case. And what I found as I worked back through after interviewing students and looking at students' profile results is when we looked at the curriculum theory, the curriculum policy rather, I'm sorry, there was no educational theory in it at all. It had begun on a supposition that this sounded a good idea. And that got me thinking about the need to try and instill into curriculum policy some theory that would support what is happening at a time when thousands of students are doing these awards. So that drew me to the work of Merleau-Ponty. And I'll always be indebted to the German language for separating, separating out Lieb, the animate living body, from corpora, the inert physical body, because the English language doesn't have that term. There isn't a word that readily describes that. And that was a, a rather breakthrough moment of understanding that transcendental subjectivities can help reinterpret bodily awareness via an intertwining that exists itself through language and speech. Now, I started writing about this in 2000, in the early 2000s, and in 2008, I tried to articulate what a Merleau-Pontian phenomenology of physical education would look like in a high-stakes examination. And this was picked up by a, uh, a British academic, Robin Barrow, who taught at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And he was a scholar of Plato, and he was a bit sceptical about this, but on the other hand, he was intrigued. And he was intrigued in thinking, we do at least need something better in our educational thinking about the body. We have very little on that. And the reason I mention this and the fact that in the years thereafter, uh, I met Stephen Stoll, who had written about the philosophy of educa uh, physical education is, that for any of you who are just starting your academic careers, uh, I'm a firm believer in the fact that good things happen once you try to get your work published because people respond to it and um, I think good things can happen from there. If we move on to Bello Ponte, one of the things that I first realized as soon as I studied it, that the relation between the lived body and thinking is a central problem of pedagogical theory and practice. Uh, little did I know that at the time. Therefore, critiquing the relationship between intentionality and rationality, the link between subjectivity and objectivity, the relationship between the individual and community are all important matters. The works of Merleau-Ponty were appealing because they seemed fundamentally to be concerned with one main question. How can we understand consciousness, the world, and their relationship? And some of these two quotes here come from his work on phenomenology uh, and, and perception. We know not through our intellect, but through our experience. And the next one was a type of quote which appears regularly uh, in type in the Sorbonne lectures. The perception of other people in the intersubjective world is problem problematic only for adults. The child has no awares of himself or of others as private subjectives, nor does he expect that all of us, himself included, are lim limited to one certain point of view of the world. Um, in the lectures, the Sorbonne lectures, generally speaking, children come out of it better than adults. I think it would be suffice to say. Um, 
The other thing that strikes you about Merleau Ponty's career is how early his work was. Uh, Phenomenology of Perception was published when he was only 37 years old. It's a really major work for such a young age. But unfortunately, as we know, Merleau Ponty died very young, age 53, uh, from heart failure. And um, that was very disappointing <coughs> in many profound ways, but not least because he may or may not have been on the cusp of his work taking a different direction with regard to the visibility of experience. And that's something uh, we need to look at in due course. If we look at the, the major works of uh, Merleau-Ponty, his first work on the structure of behavior drew on findings from Gestalt psychology. I mean, he was critical of behaviorism and he wanted to look at whole movements rather than movements that were deconstructed. So, for example, if we think of someone swimming, if you have a picture of it, a good swimmer, a fluent swimmer, what your eye is taken by is high levels of kinetic economy. The fact that they seem not to be making, doing much to move, but are moving very quickly. And so it's, whereas if you, a less skilled swimmer is making greater movement, greater effort to travel less quickly. So it's, it's these type of things become important in terms of how you view the whole thing. Uh, Merleau Ponty's view in this first text is that the links between the body and the world develop and improve. The body can make finer and finer discriminations of situation coupled with more appropriate responses. And the other, so on this account of perception, the problems between a conscious mind and an inert body can be enhanced by coming to know the world through our experiences as the embodied phenomenal body. For Merleau-Ponty, humans have a great capacity to create their environment. <clears throat> His second work, looking at phenomenology of perception, was focused on criticizing objective thought and flawed realism and idealism thinking. He proposed a new autonomy ontology based on consciousness as mutually dependent parts of one whole. For Merleau-Ponty, the body is not an object, but a form of consciousness grounded on bodily subjectivity. And his last work, which I'll talk about a bit later, was on the visible and the invisible, and it contrasts independently verifiable matters with subjective experiences, which are more subject to gesture signals. If we look at these lectures more particularly now, the eight of them, and they focus on the lived experiences and cultural context of child-parent relationships and wider thinking on embodiment and subjectivity. For Merleau-Ponty, experience is sensed or felt as a result of active engagement. For Merleau-Ponty, the child is simultaneously and without difficulty in the social realm and his body and his own body at one and the same time. Such a conjunction is fundamental as the early experience of the child informs the later reflections. Thus, experiences are vital to an understanding of the nature of knowledge and the psychology of experience. Nature and culture can be understood through an account of being in the world, i.e., for example, the body is being in permanent unity with our consciousness through things like sense and touch. Merleau, making the invisible visible, um, connects with his writing in the lectures. He wrote extensively on what he called the syncretic sociable stage. 
which presents an element of experience that defies traditional separations between the self and other and the body and the world. He drew upon the phenomenon of transitivism, which is an indistinction between self and others. Merleau-Ponty wrote, the child in the lectures, the child cannot limit himself to his own life, hence the phenomenon of transitivism. Syncretic, syncretic sociability is the rupture of the absence of divisions, a phenomenon of childhood. Okay. So there may be a point in To Kill the Mockingbird. You never really understand a person till you consider things from his point of view until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Maybe there's a truth in that. If we look at Merleau-Ponty's lectures in terms of the mind and the body, he saw a similar relationship. The body must be thought of as a mirror, the expression of the total subject psyche, the expression of a psychological history. The child understands the phenomenal body intimately. They use the, their bodies as a means in order to enter a world in contact with the external world. <clears throat> Such a position would encourage students to constructively engage with others through shared, active and engaged experiences. This approach would highlight the indicative possibilities for sensory experiences where bodily activities respond to the dynamics of the surrounding perceptual field. On this basis, new meanings can link with each other as new habits are formed and communicated, and where bodily habits convey meaning and significance, which can in due course merge with conscious reflection. <clears throat> to dissolve this distinction between the body and the world, Merleau-Ponty developed his ontology of the flesh as a device for understanding better experiences and connection between humans. Flesh, as with syncretic sociability, presents experiences, elements of experience that defy long established separations between the self and other and the body and the world. Waldenfels is a prominent uh, writer about Merleau-Ponty and he considers that flesh opens up a wide semantic array as flesh accentuates the textuality and materiality of the body while at the same moment restraining the moment of conformity, a key point, okay? not experience as the being the same. It accentuates the textuality and materiality of the body whilst restraining the moment of conformity. Flesh is visibility, flesh is perceived reality in relation to the abstract realm of ideas, invisibility. Fundamentally, Merleau-Ponty was trying to redefine the lieb corpora distinction by reconceptualizing how the body could be in permanent unity with our consciousness. In this way, the eye and the mind can reinterpret bodily awareness through an integration that can exhibit itself via language and speech. In effect, Merleau-Ponty was seeking a transition from something akin to a philosophy of consciousness to a philosophy of being in the world. Merleau-Ponty, in the lectures, he also, um, a lot of his work is underpinned by Hegel. It forms a lot of his thought. Okay? And Merleau-Ponty writes, in terms of perception, he writes about there being a very nebulous global structure that undergoes, undergoes a progressive differentiation. And what Merleau-Ponty was talking about there, in a way, 
was the importance of being led away and back from our experiences, thus engaging with both objective thoughts and subjective experiences. And Merleau-Ponty wrote, he recycled in his lectures, the Hegelian idea of surpassing while preserving, moving away and back from your experiences. Take up again what the present bodily state has rendered possible. And this lends itself to notions of practice and how you make improvement. Phenomenology involves a logic of contents where organisation does not stem from a preset logical form, but rather from a more spontaneous, in the moment, local organisation. So let's look at some of these practice ideas. What is it you see here? What's the most important thing? I look at this picture and I see the skier's eyes. I see the eyes as an insight into aspects of embodiment. The skier is defining their environment as a situation of meaning and a circumstance for action. Their body actual, actualizes the world. If we look at the eyes here, the skier is looking ahead by quite some way, and they're also looking, sorry, they're also looking slightly up, as if they're trying to angle their body to get around the pole and get as high as they can before the next turn they make, okay? So, in this picture, the skier is remaining in balance as they travel out downhill. They have an ability to perceive what to do in terms of steering and turning their skis. Now, crucially, in terms of language, they may not necessarily have an understanding in language of universal movement principles about centrifugal forces and such like, but what they have are skills which have been gained by distinctive experience. So their experiences are sensed through active engagement with the world. The skiing practice as effective as it progresses. I'll look at methodology now, if I could, because I'm conscious of time. Um, I think the view that there's a quote from Zahavi which seems to be very functional and is one we like. Um, anybody promoting a method, procedure or approach that is supposed to merit the label phenomenological should be familiar with phenomenological theory and with its philosophical origin. So essentially, we agree with that, but it does raise some challenges to consider. So I think what Zahavi was trying to get at there is we need to have some agreement about certain things. So he would talk, for example, about Herschel's analysis of part-whole relationships and the fact that logical principles cannot be reduced to individual thoughts. So Hugh, for example, if he was talking about red billiard balls again, Hugh would exist as part of a colour and it's not a colour on its own. We would need to agree with that in order to make progress. Um, we consider that Merleau-Ponty's insight into the structure of being is a central uh, emphasis on the subjective nature of experience. Merleau-Ponty outlines, we believe, a viable conception of intersubjectivity that has the capacity for both personal privacy and shared empathy, and which commences with a consciousness which is neither self nor other. Um, <clears throat> in this regard, Merleau-Ponty was of a view that such a fusion between self and others uh, cannot easily be achieved by meditative reduction or static analysis alone. It requires something greater. Merleau-Ponty 
appreciates that how others respond is closely aligned with first person uh, sensitivity and alertness. In a sense, this overtakes Herschel's dilemma of retaining a sub subjective lead into subjectivity by starting with an intersubjectivity that commences with a consciousness which is neither self nor other. We consider that potentially this generates uh, the potential for nuanced and relevant accounts of experience which avoid being shallow and self-contained. In terms of language and the importance of it, Merleau-Ponty wrote in his lectures, the meditation of the objective and the subjective, the interior and the exterior, what philosophy searches for, we can find in language if we succeed in approaching it closely. A key matter for the work that Stephen and myself are doing at the moment is the second point about distance. Is it, we've argued at present that students need to distance some aspects of the first person point of view for the purposes of objective explanation and sharing of data. Regarding the third point, comparison, <coughs> the nature of subjectivity entails our experiences, actions and our understanding of the world are open to comparison and are not private matters. In terms of students and making progress with their understanding, there would be a need for students, ideally, to understand the subjective character of their experiences and for their analysis to also investigate objective correlates. To avoid accounts being overly descriptive and to engage with deeper experiences and intentions. And at times, to take on a second person role which might be defined by obligations and the conditions that might develop a sense of communicative practice and shared empathy. We see the potential for a structural focus which contains a clear procedure for accessing and investigating a particular phenomena or phenomenal domain and a clear means of expressing and validating within a community of observers who, who are familiar with the procedure. Overall, a focus where finely grained descriptions are underpinned by objective explanations and the quality of the validation process. We believe that this could provide a common language or terminology within a community of practice. We believe that this approach would be consistent with Merleau-Ponty's Sorbonne lectures, where he identifies a categorical attitude which includes the capacity to take the initiative in executing a linguistic performance, examining the same problem in different ways, distinguishing the essential from the accidental, thinking not only of the real but of the possible, and distinguishing the ego from the exterior world. Progress on this basis might help ensure that accounts of experience are shared as knowledge as they contain a suitable degree of objective reliance. Such en endeavors can also aid the transition from description to interpretation, where language is designed to verify the veracity of experience and avoid an undue focus on reaching predetermined conclusions. Finally, I'll move to, to pedagogy. Meloponte's integrated ontology was alert to recognizing a middle ground between the subjectivity of the individual and the objecti objectivity of knowledge-led domain-specific assertions. Actualizing these forms of plurality 
requires building consensus around shared practices and observations and thereafter using speech, judgment and action to confirm the authenticity of experiences. The pressing questions pedagogically would seem to be what phenomenological informed pedagogical approaches would help students to observe, review and reflect on their self and shared experiences? How can students become perceptually aware of other students displaying psychologically rich behaviour? How can teachers and students develop empathy in relation to appreciating how things are for other students, being able to feel as others do? In terms of the context and starting points, these are some matters that I think would uh, require review. As I mentioned at the start, I think in terms of educational theory, that curriculum policy and school-based pedagogical aspirations need to engage with theorising about how students can more coherently reflect and report on the perception of reality and truth especially in relation to their embodied and intersubjective experience. I think there's a big gap between the two at the moment. Student opportunities should provide the capacity for reviewing and reflecting on the self and shared experience in a way which recognises that similar experiences do not necessarily lead to similar accounts of experience. I mentioned here starting wide. I think if we roll education back to its widest form, I think that there's a, an enormous potential for phenomenology to have a role to play in the design and the architecture of school buildings and how we use space and how we conceive that a school layout could encourage an environment of affordances. How do we design our place spaces? What do we insist upon as students' dress code? And how variable is that likely to be? I think in terms of facilitating discussion, the potential to help students engage with their experiences, recognise available choices and discern viable ways forward. This might enable students to make a greater sense of their world with their hunches and feelings informing the establishment of more rounded conceptual understandings which are both accurate, objective, plus relevant to their lives. Progress points in action might be where students can reflect on their experiences and link that potentially to some kind of emerging set of data based on their seeking senses seeing, which can underpin a reduction in a concrete and embodied way. In these micro communities of practice, there may be possibilities for students to exercise reflection and deliberation and to share instances of listening and leading as they make sense of the inner world and the wider world. A sense as well when it might be possible to merge practical experiences that become part of students' wider social conversation with the goods of practice shared internally within the class and externally across the wider life of the school. In this regard, some pedagogical adeptness and refinement at inviting students to not rush to judgment and recognise the merits of revisiting, recasting and re-emphasising diverse points of details when working with others on planning practice and learning would be needed. As Merleau-Ponty mentions in his lectures, language is a manifestation of human intersubjectivity. Language provides an access route to understanding experience which demands patience and time 
if students are going to dwell on their experiences. A place where each student is drawn forth by the sheer dialogue. Merleau-Ponty writes that language is an act of transcending. Thus, we cannot consider it simply as a container of thought. We must see it as an instrument of conquest or self through contact with others. We also need to say that our experiences and understanding of others, it is fallible, Merleau-Ponty, but however, as Merleau-Ponty notes, our relations to others is deeper than any specific uncertainty we might have with them. So what might this mean pedagogically with this group of very happy looking skiers? How would we make pedagogical gains here? What would the wise ski teacher do? I think it would help if they recognised that the skiers' movements were part imitative, but also a larger part experiential. The skier will use the natural proprioceptive kinesthetic awareness to allow their body to remain experientially visible to them through a kind of situational spatiality, which is derived from them being aware of the possibility for action that this milieu affords. These experientially visible movements may sufficiently fuse with the ski teacher's task explanation to bridge any differences there might be between the child and the adults analysis of movement. <clears throat> it would be helpful, a wise ski teacher would appreciate that the young skier's responses are likely to be more a sense of personal movement experience in response to the terrain rather than a set of movements which are designed more narrowly to merely copy or imitate those of the teacher. The wise teacher would ask themselves, is there intentionality in the skiers' movement, in their actions, in their environmentally attuned responses? It would be a context where there is a primacy of practice of movement and action, a primacy of being able to experience before stepping back later to consider change and possible ways of enhancing understanding. We would look at the potential here for practice, which takes forward dance as intersubjectivity, as part of a shared socially structured life world where there is a viable balance between similarity and different of self and others. It would be consistent with merleau ponties attempt to use language that contains a representative expressive and social function in order to integrate embodiment into our life. It would be consistent with the view of habits which operate in a sense giving way and where bodily habits convey meaning and significance and contain infinite possibilities on how immediate experiences can, through language and speech, merge with conscious reflection. It would be consistent uh, with Malti's uh, paper from Malti in 2020 who notes the body schema manifests itself as a system of lived habits involved in the foundation of meaning. It responds in a habitualized way to the appeals of things and the behavior of others. In this way, it gains its gestalt. So here we would have a practice which was based around the students having dynamic and interactive learning, which was framed by uh, open conversations on a whole matter about the language of dance and the things that would lead to it having a shared focus and a shared sense of achieving excellence and a, a focus on performance. In summary, 
I'd like to make just six quick points. I think the potential for further research in this field uh, is quite significant. And I think whether it's successful in the years ahead will depend on the talents of those who take it up. But I'm quite um, assured that that is uh, well in hand. Methodologically, I think there's a need for a clear procedure for accessing and investigating a particular phenomena and for expressing it within a community of practice. Pedagogically, I think there's a potential uh, for language to provide an access to understanding experience where patience and times is provided for students to dwell on their experiences in environments where there's a limitation on the differentiation of experience. I think that Merleau-Ponty's account of subjective and phenomenological experience can become illuminating as part of educational program that can capture how unconscious experience uh, can inform later consciousness with a certain dexterity with representational language. Habits in terms of the potential for reorganizing and an ability to make the right relationships the real function of intelligence. Merleau-Ponty writes, um, it is not about reducing language to thought. It is about introducing thought into language. If I had known that 35 years ago, I'd have been much better off. Because what I should have needed to know when I was starting teaching physical education as an exam, what the students needed was to put thought into language. That was what was required. And uh, we had to work it out ourselves, unfortunately. I think a good sign of progress would be students who can reflect on their visible and bounded sensory experiences that yield shared understanding of basic truths from which each student can reflect upon their experiences. And as a regard change, I would just like to say that is the most wonderful word here. Education from a phenomenological and existential perspective becomes an eventful, an eventful experience in which the relationship to oneself and to the world is changed. I attach great importance to that word eventful. I think event, if education was more eventful, that would be very good. Thank you very much for your time.